Eugenio, thank you for coming in. You have such a amazing background. You're still relatively quite young. I mean, uh, for somebody who's been around for like 70 years, right? So, uh, and it's quite remarkable the accomplishments you have. So uh, thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So Eugenio, one, one of the things that my audience is always curious about is you have so much success in such an early uh, age and throughout your entire uh, career, and you got so much more to go. So what were some of the inflection points? And maybe it was something that happened when you were five, or maybe it was in school, a mentor, could be someone in your family, uh, maybe career choices that happened, but really things that were change makers in your life that uh, created this remarkable success history that you have. Well, first of all, thank you for the you know, kind words. I would say that something that definitely helped me was relatively early in my career and my life, I understood the power of people. I studied engineering, I'm an engineer by training, and I quickly realized how sometimes you know, us as engineers and people in technology sometimes maybe forget a bit the human component. We focus a bit too much on some of the you know technicalities the data, the technology, because it's fascinating, because it's a beautiful, uh, you know, endeavor. It's something that can really do a lot, but sometimes it's a bit misleading. Sometimes we forget that technology has to have a purpose. So I'd say that early on in my career, probably between college and uh, grad school, I said, I understand the power of people, the power of connecting with people, the power of networking. And just in general, in listening, in listening to what people need. And usually that's something that is very helpful for, you know, obviously the others that can feel heard, that can feel that their issues are understood, but also for us and especially for me, because I can learn a lot about what's needed in the industry, what are some of the pain points, and then find ways to address that. So putting people before has probably been my mantra so far. So what I'm hearing is, is that, and, and I know this too, is, uh, you, you know, uh, you can be very technically oriented and have uh, a great background experience from a technical standpoint, but you really need to know how to engage with people because ultimately it's, it's people, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, I used to teach many, many years ago, I used to teach uh, computing technology, uh, you know, computing science, I used to teach mathematics and then also business and especially amongst my computing students, I always found that there was this kind of gap on the, on the people side. There was, a, but uh, you're absolutely right. You have to have this sort of engagement networks and so on. And you clearly show that. Uh, and you indicated you studied um, engineering. So uh, tell me what that experience was like when you studied engineering. Yeah, so I said engineering in Italy, which is also slightly different from other countries. It's a pretty theoretical experience in uh, in Italy, in undergrad. You learn most of the basics. And we, in particular, learn a lot about you know, both software, electronic engineering, so both software and hardware. So a very good horizontal understanding of everything that's technology, from building a computer to writing code. And so was really helpful to gain a foundation, exactly what you said, which is you know, technology and the power of technology. But to some extent, was a bit oriented more towards the basics, towards 1970s, 1980s, you know, the beginning of transistor, CMOS, uh, computers, and computer programming. So to some extent, we gained a lot in understanding the foundation, but we lost a bit in everything that is uh, to some extent, you know, the skills that are in demand and were in demand at that point in time. And I'd say that still ties a bit to the concept of, you know, putting people first. Like, we definitely learned the basics of technology, but we didn't know what people needed, what employers needed. And so that created a bit of a gap that then we had to uh, you know, overcome, so to say. And I'll say also, you're doing so much technology at the beginning, doing so much engineering was great, but sometimes we and especially I realized how the people component was not put first. We were doing technology because we really liked it. We really liked to you know, create software, create code that was clever, that was almost 
you know, a sign of something that we can do, but it was solving no problem at all. And so I then moved more towards you know, bioengineering, healthcare engineering, to try and bridge that gap. So to try and use technology for a purpose. You know, that's really interesting. And uh, and I can, again, see this sort of thread of, you know, people first and having this uh, practical aspect of solutions uh, that are purposeful and have some kind of impact. And I can see that throughout your career. You went to different schools, though. You went to uh, schools in Italy, and then you went to MIT and Harvard and um, the U.S., and then Imperial College in London. You know, what are the differences? That, you know, what are the advantages of each one of those different uh, milestones in your life from an educational standpoint? What do you think are the strengths of the Italian education versus the MIT Harvard education versus the Imperial College, uh, because they're different, right? There's there's similarities, yeah. but there's got to be differences. Yeah, that's a great question. There are quite a few differences, I'd say. First of all, something like an Italian education tends to be a bit more theoretical, has a great advantage in the sense that it teaches you a lot of the basics, a lot of the theory, and you get to better understand why things are done this way. And this obviously creates some sort of you know, culture, which tends to be a bit more horizontal, which allows you to then draw on a lot of different you know, uh, parts, also maybe you know, not too technical concepts, but it also teaches you things which probably are not too relevant. The first thing that we learned was to read binary code. So right now I can read binary code, I can write binary code, but it's not the most useful skill in the job market. And so you can see in the UK and even more in the US, universities are slightly less theoretical, which of course has its pros and cons, but definitely has a lot of pros on setting people up for success in the work environment. And I've seen a lot more uh, joint efforts, so to say, between academia and companies in trying to craft a curriculum in universities that was setting students up for success, trying to make them learn the skills that are needed. So maybe instead of learning assembly or binary code like I did, we were learning an MIT, Python, R, and that was fantastic because for data scientists and for a lot of people in technology, those are the things to do. So a few pros and cons, and I tend to personally prefer a more pragmatic approach that allows you to understand also what's gonna be a real life situation and not just in theory. So let's drill down further. So I can clearly see now the, the difference between Italian education and then the MIT, Harvard, and, and, and Imperial College. So what are the differences between MIT and Harvard and then MIT and Harvard versus Imperial College, right? So so, so I would say probably MIT and Harvard tend to be even, even more so oriented towards the you know, pragmatic applications of education. And there is especially a strong focus on career development. So I've seen a lot of benefits in having conversation with uh, within the masters, within the programs there, with the career development uh, officers there. So in trying to learn how to better position yourself in the job market as a competitive applicant. So a lot of things about networking, about you know being thoughtful in the way that we uh, interact with uh, recruiters and so on. So very strong focus on the recruitment process and how to be successful in the um, work environment, in the job applications. Well, in the UK, it is definitely very oriented towards the um, job application process as well, but maybe not as much as in the US. While it holds still a bit of the you know, theoretical aspects and the research aspects. So definitely a few differences there as well. And then and lastly, between MIT and Harvard, because they're not the same school. So there's there's a different culture. Describe how they're different. They're definitely not, yeah. I, I found probably Harvard to be obviously more classical, as someone might expect, in the sense that the pace there, I also find the pace slightly more balanced at Harvard. It's neither good nor bad, but I definitely found the ability to you know, digest information more attainable at Harvard. So more of a focus on uh, maybe 
taking a bit slower, but also being able to understand the concepts further. While MIT, um, fast paced environment, which has, again, it's pros and cons. And MIT, we tend to say it's like drinking from a fire hose. So it's yes. so much information. And so obviously it sets you up for success later on in life because you are trained, you know, with the, with the best and you are in a situation where there's a lot of mathematical concepts very fast. So obviously much more technical and a lot of information at once. So that's a quite a spectrum, right? Sort of very traditional learning binary code. And I, I used to do binary code as well on a similar side. I fully uh, comprehend. And uh, in fact, I used to teach some of that too. So so I can see this sort of very, very old school way, uh, very broad. And then you talk about MIT also be more practical, but so much information thrown at you, right? And Harvard's a little bit... Uh, uh, more balanced that you say and more kind of even um and perhaps a little bit more stylistic like uh, classical and then imperial would also be somewhere in between right more more perhaps more classical but you indicated there's this, this differentiation with mit harvard and imperial right? more practical than the italian education so you know that's useful for the audience yeah, that they'll, they'll know you know your background but that would also make you stronger uh wouldn't it to, to have these different schools the different experiences it'll help you think in oblique mm -hmm. ways better than if you just had one style of education yeah absolutely and going back to what you were saying at the beginning of some of the successes so to say i've had also come from this ability to adapt to different environments so being able to understand that each university, each job, each work environment is a challenge in itself and it has its own rules, its own, it's almost as if it was a game in itself that you have to learn the rules first and then be able to master those rules. So say, you know, in Italy it was a bit more about memorizing, learning uh, a lot of theoretical information and understanding that value there of this culture. And maybe, you know, at MIT it was a bit more about understanding the power of joining some events where there were potential employers and being thoughtful, you know, in the way that maybe we send uh, thank you notes to those people. So a lot of benefits, but also come from this ability to adapt and to understand that you have to be very flexible in the way you approach all these different things. And the education in Italy is, is uh, provided by the government from what I understand. Isn't it free? It, it depends. Yeah. It's, much more free than in the US for sure. So uh, the cost of tuition in uh, the US is orders magnitude higher than in uh, Italy. So you might be able to, with a thousand dollars or even nothing, if like me, you don't come from a very wealthy background, to be able to go for university without having to spend a, a cent. And that's one of the big differences as well between you know, Italy, the UK and, and the US in Italy is much more of a benefit provided by government or at least incentivized by the government, while in the U.S. a bit more of a business with its pros and cons. Now, you became a Forbes under 30. Uh, how, did, how did that happen, do you, do you think? I would say because, again, I've always been trying to put people first and to try and understand how to basically start from there, start from the people, and then come up with um, good technology that answer people's questions. And one of the examples was during the COVID-19 pandemic at MIT, I was there between 2019 and 2020. So in March 2020, we definitely had a huge shock. We were you know, by ourselves in campus. We, out of the blue, had to you know, completely change how we approach life and how also we approach studies. And I helped co-found this task force there that tried to use analytics and data science, which is what we were studying. So together with professors and researchers at MIT mostly, we tried to go online, you know, with automatic processes, with web scraping, to try and gather all of this data, all of this information into one single data set containing information on hospitalizations uh, and you know everything else that might be related to COVID-19 infections. 
And we then trained models that were able to predict across the country where some of these uh, you know, hot pockets, hot areas uh, of infection might have been in a few weeks' time. And in this way, we would have been able to provide insights to some of the key stakeholders there, like governments, the White House, and so on, on where to direct personnel, PPE, masks, and so on, before these uh, areas actually became hotspots for COVID. And, and we actually end up you know, speaking with a lot of government officials, with a lot of folks, to try and direct the you know, right resources that were very limited in the right areas. So I would say definitely that helped is probably one of the key reasons why I had the honor to be in, be in Forbes list. But it's especially because we tried to do something which made sense and which helped people and then use technology to basically do that. So that's really interesting. And uh, while you're at MIT, you actually developed this uh, data analytics system. You did uh, you collected data from different sources, and you were able to apply that to train models so that you can do predictive analysis or predictive uh, indicators of where you know the pandemic was going to you know uh, concentrate or build and so on. And that could be of use to White House and CEOs and other leading research institutions. And because you took that leadership role in doing this and applying your knowledge, and and you would actually have to code as well, um, you then got this recognition as Forbes under 30. So did you also then become the World Economic Forum Global Shaper from that work? Did that sort of relate it to that work? To some extent, yeah. It's this passion of it. Work with the World Economic Forum is more let's say, um, I wouldn't call it charity work, but it's definitely more volunteer focus work. So trying to put together our skills, less on the technical side with the World Economic Forum, but still more about connecting with people, connecting with uh, uh, you know stakeholders across governments and companies to try and find ways to meet the you know the social development goals, sustainability development goals, of the United Nations. So definitely that experience from you know, working with uh, White House officials, uh, government officials, and so on, helped a lot and still helps a lot because it was one of those situations where you can clearly see how you might come from MIT, you might be a very technical person, but you really have to understand that not everyone is like that. Not everyone is speaking the same language as you, and we might not think about what you do or the way you think is um, the usual one. It's not the usual one for them. So a lot of learning how to communicate with non-technical stakeholders, non-technical people, and especially people in the government that have you know, big issues, not much time, and they want to better understand what policies to make or just what decisions to take. And that definitely applies both to the experience with um, you know, COVID-19 and that task force as well as now with the World Economic Forum. Yeah, I mean, I can see how all of this, um, you know, outreach and volunteer work you've done and taking leadership has then sort of built on each other. And then it leads to things like being uh, involved in the World Economic Forum as a global shaper. Uh, you get this Forbes under 30, which gives you uh, TED uh, speaking engagements. Uh, you're a contributor to like uh, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fortune, as well as uh, different journals. This will then result in awards. Uh, and there, there's this confluence of all of these activities that sort of help to amplify um, what you're doing. You then uh, got into uh, CVC, uh, CVS Health, which is actually the world's largest health company. And um, I didn't know that, by the way. <laughs> When I was, uh, I actually asked Bing AI to say, you know, tell me something about CV, CVS Health, and you're like a Fortune five company or something. You're you're in the even in the global um, rankings, you're amongst the top uh, in revenue and size and clinics. And um, I checked with one of my partners, and I said, you know, uh, I met this gentleman named Eugenio, and he's a uh, data science leader at CVC Health. He said, CVC Health, yeah, they're really good. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, very impact-driven, uh, very uh, thoughtful, 
in terms of your uh, that work. So you're integrated into that ecosystem of CBC Health, CVS Health. So how did you get hired? And then describe your career journey in CVS, uh, CVS Health, where you're now a data science leader. Yeah, so I definitely got you know, approached while at MIT, so towards the end, I'd say that all of the experience you know, working in AI for healthcare has definitely helped because that's what you, uh, as you said, that's what we do. So we focus a lot on data, on data science and AI to try and make a positive impact on uh, society. And that's one of the things that I really like the most. So be able to align both the financial incentives, uh, the ability of being a business, making a profit with the ability to make an impact on society and on people's health. And I'd say one of the most beautiful things about CBS is this ability to align both the components, the financial component and the positive impact component. And it's not usually the case with most. And my trajectory so far in the company has been a relatively classic one, so to say, in the sense that I started as a data scientist. So very hands-on coding, coding machine learning pipelines, trying to make predictive models and so on. And I then became more senior in that position. And now I'm a manager. So my role is more of a player and coach type of situation. So I obviously still code, but much less than I used to. And I find a lot of joy actually in managing people and being people and trying to better understand how not just to do something, but how to convey that information and basically try to replicate what I can do in you know, many more ways and try to be an effective leader that way. And in your uh, role as data science leader at CVS Health, you're also involved in innovation. Can you describe what that means to the audience? Yeah, definitely. Like a big component that especially of my team is trying to innovate and find new ways to create products, machine learning products usually, that can help people. So it's not just about you know, fixing bugs, developing features, but it's trying to come up with new products that can help people in um, innovative ways and in new creative ways. And what this means is simply that sometimes, like in most of the data science uh, uh, pipelines, you might start with analyzing, analyzing data and trying to understand what are some potential opportunities or big issues across the country. So there might be some diseases that might be you know, really relevant in the US that might be affecting a lot of people. And they might also have a huge impact, not just on their health, but also on their um, you know, financial uh, situation. And so the innovative ways to come up with products sometimes is just about using this data to come up with decisions. So a lot of data-driven decision-making and then thinking about how can we address this disease, so to say, to um, improve the situation, the condition of people through machine learning. So it's a lot of coming up with concepts of machine learning pipelines that can uh, provide insights to us internally and then to the actual people, to the actual members of our community to improve their health and um, also save a lot of money by avoiding hospitalization. So that's pretty much what we try and do. You know, you're a data scientist and you're in machine learning and AI and you won all of these awards like the McCarthy Award, John McCarthy Award for contributions to AI, the Novo, no, Nova Talent of the Year Award, the ISPI uh, BCG Featured Leaders Award, and we talked earlier, you've been featured in, you know, Forbes, Fortune, HBR, Washington Post, Bloomberg, Financial Times, and so on. And, and in fact, I'm interviewing you because you're, because of the nature of your work and it's so profound and has so much impact. You know, taking, taking all of that into consideration, then you'd have a, a pretty good lens of, you know, what are the emerging areas that people need to pay attention to? So... Uh, so first of all, because you are a data scientist and you're in machine learning AI, what are some really exciting areas and how are you involved in those exciting areas and where do you think that they're going to go? So I would definitely say artificial intelligence is one of those 
but again, it has to be used in ways that can be, you know, sensible and meaningful for the people that are going to be impacted by AI. And I think that's one of the issues sometimes is when we have tools as powerful as ChatGPT or all of the other large language models, the question is not anymore about what we can do or you know, how can we make better models, but rather how can we use the tools that we have to make a positive impact without uh, you know, affecting negatively all of this population because of the power of these tools. And I think especially in the healthcare domain, we're going to see a lot of benefits from the artificial intelligence um, tools and capabilities that we're experiencing. And I tend to think of this as three different pillars, the three P, as I call them. So predictions, uh, personalization, and paperwork. So some of the big issues in um, healthcare pretty much revolve around these three different pillars. Uh, the first one of them is the fact that if you think about medicine, it's more about curing a disease. But sometimes that's already too late. Obviously, none of us wants to get a disease and then having to go to a hospital and be cured. Ideally, we like to prevent, to predict the you know, possibility of a disease and then prevent it by taking the right actions. And that's something that AI and a lot of what I've been doing over the past revolves around. So we can use historical information to predict the progression of a disease or you know, the onset of a disease and then provide information to the people that might be affected in the future by this disease on what to do to avoid that. And so that's fascinating to me because it changes completely the concept of medicine from curing disease and having to take medications, going to a hospital, seeing a clinician to instead preventing that. So being healthy and, um, and avoiding that. That pretty much boils down also to the second one, which is the personalization component. So how can we improve the health of these people with recommendations and tailored information and do this in ways that it's um, effective, personalized, and takes into account all of their characteristics. But it's um, probably the third on paperwork, the one I'm most fascinated about, which is the fact that AI, especially ChatGPT, can reduce by a lot of the time that doctors spend in hospital not dealing with patients or so dealing with admin tasks, with data entry in their you know, EHR systems and so on. So try to cut down all of that time spent away from patients and putting the doctors close to a patient. That's definitely something that I find fascinating. So let's drill into this a, a bit further. So you talked about uh, AI being applied from a personalization precision mm -hmm. medicine standpoint, and it has this predictive capability, which can then help in prevention. And then of course it reduces uh, the workflow, helps to improve the efficiency of the workflow and paperwork, as you mentioned, and so on. And then you talked about uh, foundational models of which large language models with a uh, fit within foundational models. And this is within the sort of broad scope of AI and within AI, you have machine learning and within machine learning, you have deep learning. And, and within those, you have large language models, uh, which are foundational models and there's other kinds. So there's kind of this hierarchy. And then you talked about chat GPT, uh, which uh, uh, that technology or, or uh, GPT has been uh, embedded into Microsoft products like Bing AI. In fact, that's how I found out more about CBC at CBS Health was putting into Bing AI. And I, I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty good. So I use it a lot. And then you've seen all the announcement from Microsoft, Microsoft Build come out uh, later this month, uh, where they're going to talk about all of the different kinds of integration they're doing with uh, uh, G, uh, GPT technology. And so they fully embraced it. And... Um, but you saw Jeffrey Hinton come out uh, this week and saying, you know what, I'm going to retire from Google. And and he, you know, really is supportive of Google and what they're doing. But he says he's, uh, and and I, I got to be careful. So I, I recommend the audience go and search online so you get his direct voice. But my interpretation is, uh, what he's saying is, is that he had, he didn't realize it was going to be that fast. He thought that some of the things that you're seeing now are going to be, what, 30 or 50 years into the future. And then he, see, he realizes that this is progressing much faster 
and and that capability is uh, much more profound than he had originally thought would happen this quickly. And so that's why he's now going out in public and so on. So I, I want to talk about what that means from an opportunity and positive standpoint. Uh, do you think these generative pre-trained transformers, that's what GPT stands for, do you think uh, these um, GPT-4 and some other kind of models that are out there uh, and of which uh, um, Microsoft has embraced, do, do you believe that they will become much more AGI oriented, uh, which um, I think uh, Jeffrey Hinton, a really famous uh, computer scientist is alluding to. And then I'm thinking about uh, some of the engineer, like the engineer last year from Google, who came out and said, oh my God, this this thing is like, has more capability. And he, he ended up leaving the company. Um, and and at that time, I remember uh, really a lot of backlash because people are saying this this gentleman is way out there and this is an outlier thinking it's not the mainstream. Mm -hmm. But now you see this sort of turn of the tide where people are thinking, no, there's a lot of keep and and it's literally within a year, and literally yeah. when <laughs> when OpenAI released uh, ChatGPT and people started using it. So what what are your predictions on this? Do you think that there's this uh, like in one of the Microsoft papers they said sparks of AGI or uh, do you think that that's where it's going? And even though it's not human intelligence, it's some kind of capability. And and what does that mean for you? Because if you look online again, you see uh, I see a a piece by Peter Lee, is a VP of research at uh, Microsoft. And it's a very well thought out piece and I guess a, a book uh, or some sort. And where they can see a lot of advantages. Of course, they, there's guardrails you need and there's there's uh, areas where, where it's deficient, but they can see where it can help in the medical area. So I like your thoughts on that because you work with the largest health company in the world. You lead innovation. And you've and you've worked with uh, generative AI, so you have a pretty good on these foundational models. So you know what its capabilities are. So I like your deeper thoughts on this. Yeah. Well, first of all, I gotta say that I think every person in AI has been very surprised about the speed at which AI has been going over the past year. And like Hinton, I also when ChatGPT started, I basically told everyone like I would have never thought that would have changed so much, especially of the creative arts, you know, like drawing, writing, and so on, in such a fast um, time, such a quick time. And I think that boils down to the fact that artificial intelligence has not been following a linear fashion, but rather an exponential fashion. And now I believe that we hit that inflection point, and we as humans are terrible in, you know, thinking in non-linear terms. And I think that's what we're seeing, all of these people, you know, quitting Google or having other, you know, conversations in general about we never expected this to go this fast. I would say it's probably boils down to the fact that we cannot think in non-linear terms. And so I think that something now is going so fast is, um, is mind blowing. And I definitely think that as Bill Gates said, we are now in the age of AI. You know, I'm a bit biased, of course, and I definitely think that we are approaching AGI faster than we thought we were going to. And this is at least my take. I know that talking about AGI is always a very difficult topic. It's always a very sensitive topic. But I don't think, of course, that we've reached AGI yet. But I feel that when a system almost feels like sometimes, or it might be tricking someone into thinking that it might have reached AGI, I would say that's really a pretty good indication that what in the right path for that. I think that some of the interactions that I have with ChatGPT definitely sound human, definitely sound like I'm talking to someone who's an expert. And sometimes it's actually pretty scary because when I ask it to write code or I give it feedback, it implements it sometimes better than humans as well. And we even saw some articles saying that um, ChatGPT and artificial intelligence was put against doctors in terms of, you know, empathy, accurateness of the um, responses to patients' questions. 
And we saw that AI was almost sometimes even better on the empathy side. So it's doing a great job in you know, getting to that AGI point. And I think what's fascinating there, for me at least, it's not even anymore of a technological component, you know, the deep learning neural network structure or how it actually works, but rather the societal implications. The fact that now everybody has access to super powerful models and you can use them to create videos automatically. You can use them to create music. You can use them in so many different ways that we're going to see new avenues, new areas that we've never thought about before. And I think that's a, you know, the most fascinating part is the fact that it's unlocking some areas that we thought would have not been unlocked for probably hundreds of years. So have you uh, tried, and you must have, I guess. I mean, uh, can you talk about the speed of papers coming out where, I mean, I've been in this thing for so long. I even embedded some sort of AI kind of capability in a system I wrote in 1986. So, and then um, you would look at these different papers coming out over the years. Maybe it's one every, one major one every year, then maybe one every quarter or something. <laughs> Can you talk about the the nature of some of these papers coming out? And and because of the role you have, you probably are sampling a lot of them. So that that side. And then if you could talk about have you played with auto G, GPT? And 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 we're still at the very beginning of it, what the implications are. So two parts of that question. The acceleration yeah. of papers coming out, which are really interesting. And then this auto GPT and, and what that means, if you can define what it does and then where you see that going, because we're just at its initial launch. And it seems to me two weeks ago when I looked up, uh, I think it was GitHub, there's like over a hundred thousand or something like that, likes or whatever, like uh, acknowledgements that this is something that's really interesting, right? So. Yeah, first of all, I've never seen a speed like the current one in terms of you know throughput of AI papers. And it's both amazing and also a bit scary sometimes because I would say the you know the beauty of all of this is that obviously we have so much research being thrown every single uh, day out and we have so much to go through. But that at the same time is the issue like people even like me, I one of my biggest issues is how can I stay on top of all of this progress and be aware of all of the different types of models, better architectures, try at least and read maybe the abstract of each paper. It's not possible. We cannot become experts in all of these papers. But then it also begs a bit of a question of whether we are doing right in publishing so much so quickly. I'm not a big fan because I simply think it's not possible to stop the progress of artificial intelligence. But it sounds a bit like when in COVID, during COVID-19, we had so many papers about COVID-19 and machine learning models about COVID-19. I would say that to some extent, all of that work done so quickly might have hurt a bit the you know, healthcare industry and our ability to react to that situation because of the amount of information it was impossible to go through and many conflicting thoughts, many different opinions. And so to some extent, I'm very excited about the you know, new amount of uh, uh, papers and the speed at which they're being generated. But at the same time, I'm also a bit cautious because we really need to understand better all of these um, algorithms. And to answer the second part of the question, I've not actually played with AutoGPT yet. I think I'll do today. It sounds like it's the right thing to do, but I've seen a lot of you know, uh, people publishing and writing about it. And to me, it's the fascinating thing about all of this and what I was saying before that we are now in the age of AI is the fact that we have these tools that are so capable, that are so good, that we can unlock all of these different areas. We can have not just a chatbot, not just a tool to very well converse with, but we actually can have systems that do tasks for us. They even you know, now generate videos, generate music, but also some people have created some sort of uh, ecosystem you know, with artificial intelligent entities, uh, they create their own society. And so I feel that definitely we're not in the, uh, at the AGI level, but we're approaching very much to it. It's very, very close. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing about auto auto GPT, I mean, it's an open source, or you can or you can put it into your machine. I mean, into your computer, you can start playing with it. And there's even um, free sites where you can have a sandbox and try it. Of course, if you if it consumes too many compute cycles, then you have to uh, get an open AI license or, or something like that. But the, the, and I think one of them is what um, agent uh, GPT, something like that. And, you know, there's these free ones. I, again, the audience can just do a search in Bing AI and and uh, look at uh, you know what are some of the free sites on auto. GPT and then how can you there's even the YouTube videos on how to download it and install it and then play with it and so on. I I ran it um about two weeks ago and I was surprised what it does. I was thinking I went, wow. Because <laughs> it self-prompts. Like normally you when you work with a GPT, you're 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 doing you're it's like uh you're generating the prompts to guide it. This thing prompts itself. <laughs> you give it yeah. goals and it prompts itself to, to solve uh, your goals. Unless it runs out of compute, then it says, oh, you should go and get a license from OpenAI and then you can continue this journey. But then I'm thinking, oh my God, it could run up a bill. That <laughs> um, yeah. uh, whereas you, you, know, you work with a large company, so they could absorb that as you uh, play with it. But... Uh, but maybe there's a scary side too, right? Because it can write code and then refine it on its own. Yeah. That's what I think it's it's fascinating. It's that it can create its own code, it can create its own, you know, system itself. Like we can have AI creating AI. And we've seen that it can create code better than uh, us to some extent. And so I'm fascinated about the things that it can do. And as you said, if it can prompt itself, it can just work towards a goal. I think that's a whole, whole new concept. That's all something that can even create them, you know, new algorithms, even better ones and come up with creative ideas. So it's reshaping, not just, you know, the creative arts, like um, journalism and so on. It's reshaping everything, basically. Have you, have you uh, played with the Hugging Face um, program at, or Hugging Face community at all? Or Yeah, a bit of uh, with that as well, too. And especially with... Dali 2 and all of the image generation tools as well. I think those are also game changers. So maybe you can describe to the audiences what is Hugging Face and then you know, what does that mean? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, it's a company providing pretty much or at least trying to provide open source software but it's about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it's trying to build a community and ecosystem of machine learning tools, platforms, and uh, and resources. And so I would say probably that's also one of the reasons why we're having such a huge progress because we have had these amazing changes uh, you know, in, uh, in AI, but at the same time, there are a lot of parties that are trying to foster the open source, uh, you know, or open sourcing code, but also data at the same time. And that's showing amazing results because we can then build on top of each other. I'm a big fan of open source software and, uh, and data. I think one of the things that Hugging Face is also doing very well is understanding the ability also to capitalize on open source. It might sometimes seem as a good way to lose money, to not be a real business, but it's actually having a lot of different benefits and they are capitalizing a lot on that. Yeah, and then you can build a... Um... A, um, a, a GPT system that automatically calls the different tools that are specialized, right? So, um, it, I mean, it's just quite remarkable where this is going. And I can see why, I mean, uh, I saw Jeffrey Hinton come out maybe, I don't know, a month ago when he did this uh, interview with CBS. And if you went on YouTube, there was a much deeper 40 something minutes. And it was a very thoughtful um, discussion. I recommend the audience look at it because it's it's not uh, he uh, it's not alarmist and alarmist kind of existential way, but it's it's a very thoughtful discussion of where it's going and the implications of it, right? And then you can see him talking more about that uh, lately. So uh, really interesting. 
Okay, so we, we've explored that uh, journey of AI and the foundation models uh, to a certain extent. And, uh, you know, you, you clearly it's going to have an impact in medicine and the medical field and, and the clinical side and so on. Are there any other transformational areas that you think are interesting because you're in healthcare? And um, I'll see that question, for example, if you look at Yamanaka and then He's now an advisor to a company that's uh, it's it's reported that Jeff Bezos is a is an investor in this company and it, and it has to do with aging and I, and I believe if you look at some of the media indicating that it had the most sort of uh, seed funding of any startup or one of the most funded of any startup and then you have uh, David Sinclair uh, and his work on the aging side. Um, are you following any of that work on biomedical innovation? And then there's other aspects of biomedical innovation. Uh, for example, Philip Wong has the ability to insert these microchips that are a fraction of the size of a cell, and it can sense, it can act as a sensor. You can use these uh, chips for uh, monitoring and also influence the behavior of cells. Or if you look at the work at Terasaki Institute, they've got these uh, microfluidic. Uh, kind of technologies, other uh, biomedical innovation technologies and so on. Are you following any of that? Or, and do you have any comment on that or things that you think are really exciting? A bit of that, yeah. I find you know, everything is related to kind of like the human uh, genomics, uh, all of the biomedical engineering areas too. I studied biomedical engineering at Imperial College and I think that everything is about human augmentation and you know enhancing the human condition not just through AI, it's fantastic, it's fascinating, it's the way to go. But again, we are seeing so many tools so quickly that have a huge potential also, possible drawbacks, I'm thinking like CRISPR and all of these technologies. And those obviously are tools that can show you like AI, a lot of benefits, but also a lot of the possible issues. And every time that we deal with people, every time that we deal with you know humans in the loop, it's a bit of a challenge because we can be extremely powerful. We can do a lot for better or for worse. And what is actually fascinating to me is seeing how AI can help in all these different areas. And so we've seen also with DeepMind AI helping in coming up with new protein structures for drugs, for, uh, for solutions. But I would say that was before the you know, generative AI, the large language models, so I'm fascinated now to even see the intersection of AI and biomedical engineering and all of these uh, new endeavors, because I think that AI can definitely come up with you know, new solutions, with new ways, and also solve a lot of the problems. There might be auto GBT type of solutions that query themselves and prompt themselves to try and find solutions to some of the big problems of biomedical engineering. And that's probably one of the fascinating things with, with AI. It's, just, it's horizontal and it can apply to virtually any industry, any area. You know, you, you talk about uh, DeepMind and AlphaFold 2, where they uh, open source, they actually uh, release the protein, uh, protein structures of, of hundreds of millions of uh, proteins, right? And this is some sometimes called the dark matter of proteins because people didn't even know they existed. <laughs> so, and then, and uh, typically in a lab or uh, to do this kind of structure could take a year, two years, something like that. They did, they did all of it, right? So uh, pretty much. And, and then they released it, making it available to everybody. I mean, I, humans just couldn't even do that. It's just not even possible, right? So... <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. It's, yeah, it's a lucky new potential. And I think that's probably one of the issues right now is that we can do so much. We have so many options, opportunities, almost is some sort of, you know, analysis paralysis, where there is so much we can do, so many different things, but we almost get sometimes you know, a bit crushed by all of the different ways we can use AI to, to change all the things we're doing. But well, you're at the perfect spot. I mean, is, are you investigating quantum computing too? Because a lot of the health phenomena is nature, right? And quantum computing, uh, com quantum computers very much align with anything that's sort of 
nature based, right? It's a it's a perfect uh, combination, uh, providing they can get you know the better coherence and manage noise better and things like that. And there's a lot of work, a lot of uh, money going into this. So um, it used to be maybe 10 years ago, people used to think quantum computing, that's 2100 or 2050. They don't, if you, the majority of the people I talk to don't think that anymore. They think it's in the near term, you know, 2035, maybe even before 2030 and niche applications already now and more so by 2025. That's uh, when I talk to quantum computing uh, people. So, are, is your um, are you looking at it because it's going to have an impact on health, right? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely something that I'm in no way an expert, but I think it's something to definitely keep an eye on, and it's going to be another huge innovation in the world. I think it's fascinating to see how the world is going in this direction of having, at the same time, all of these you know, once in a lifetime almost uh, you know innovative. So you have AI, quantum computing, uh, CRISPR, and so on. I would say that's one of the reasons I'm so you know, hopeful and optimistic, at least, on the potential of technology for the next hundreds of years of, or so. It's the fact that you can have something as powerful as quantum computing, providing even more computational power to all of these technologies, including AI. So you can have quantum computing running AI systems. Uh, and I don't even know how powerful this AI system can be with all of that power stored from um, quantum computing. And obviously it doesn't apply only to AI, it applies to everything. But it's fascinating to see you know, this new sort of technological revolution or industrial revolution, thanks to all of these key components that are you know, the right ones at the right time. Yeah, we we live in a, a an unusual time because of this escalation of uh, exponential transformational tech, but it's it's exponential exponential. <laughs> it's not just exponential; it's just like onto itself, right? So, and and you're leading a lot of this, right, uh, due to your work. So, what will life look like in 2030? <laughs> if it is one thing I learned, is not to make predictions anymore because clearly I'm uh, I'm wrong I'm not able to you know keep the pace of progress that I would say definitely AI is going to become much more of an integral part of our lives for better or for worse so I definitely think that that's the way we're going AI is not going to become anymore you know um entity in itself it's more going to be a feature everything is going to have some sort of uh, AI in it, which is why it's fascinating to be in that area because I think it can apply to horizontally every different sector. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm though very interested in the data component is that I hope that by 2030, we're going to have a much better data structure because at the end of the day, that's the you know, fuel that all of the AI needs. So I definitely think that by 2030, we're going to have AI in every system in every tool, but I also hope that we're going to have a better data infrastructure, not just for healthcare, but for anything, because if we can unlock that power, then we can really have huge benefits. So what role will synthetic data play in this? I'm honestly not a huge fan of synthetic data, just because I find it a, a great technical solution but not so much of a great you know, um, real life, um, true people solution in the sense that usually synthetic data is generated by just that small amount of data that we have. So it tends to perpetrate all of the um, biases, you know, continue all of the biases, all of the discriminations that we have. You know, if we have in healthcare data, a small population and we expand that, we create synthetic data based on that. It's usually a situation where we're tricking a system, an algorithm, to thinking that that's everything we have, everything we can possibly have. It might be not even considering some minorities, some other areas. So definitely I would say it's a solution, it's a possible solution, but I think there's a lot of way to go before we can use it well, I would say, especially in, a, in an ethical way. 
You know, that's uh, interesting. And um, are you working on the ethical sort of principle side and then operationalizing that, sort of embedding that in your work? And then, you know, what, if you are, then what communities would you recommend to, for people out there in the audience? I mean, I, I often recommend Microsoft because Microsoft has mm -hmm. a, a pretty, a very mature, responsible AI program um, operationalizing. And that means making practical ways that you can uh, do AI in a responsible way. Uh, they even have uh, material for executives who are considering embedding AI into their companies. There's UNESCO and others. Are, are, are you embedded in some of that work as well or, or plan to be? Yeah, that's definitely one of my key areas of focus right now is the ethics of AI. I have often a lot of conversation with also professors across the world about you know the principles but also how can we put, bring this to practice and i'd say that's the um, biggest issue uh, so right now we have such powerful tools it's not anymore about how can we make them better how can we make that accuracy or that AUC score better it's more about how can we ensure that we're treating people fairly we're not you know perpetrating biases and so on and so the ethics of the eyes especially for now when we have a strange situation with a lot of power in AI systems, but also at the same time, a lot of uh, lack of regulation, as we definitely have to go in that direction. But I would say the most challenging point right now of ethics is the fact that people tend to focus on high level principles, which are great, but everybody agrees on them. Everybody agrees on, you know, not perpetrating bias, not, you know, perpetrating uh, discriminations and so on. It's more of a matter of that data is by definition biased it will always be it's more about finding pragmatic ways to eliminate this bias with this reducer and and as you said microsoft is a great tool i'll say also ibm's ai fairness 360 ecosystem is a great one to ensure fairness in systems and that's what i'm trying to focus on right now is looking online all the possible ways we can do fairness and epic and so on, but not through principles, but through actual tools and best practices and codify them so that every data scientist can do what they would like to do. So actually ensure ethics in the systems. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I just did a fireside for a company called Avana. They, I'm the, I was the only speaker. <laughs> so they they asked me for a keynote and I said, well, why don't we just do a chat? So I didn't ask me anything. <laughs> And uh, it was really amazing because you had this broad spectrum in the audience. You had scientists and engineers and executives and uh, project managers. And Avanade is a tech company, right? It's a, it's a company. It's it's a, probably the world's largest Microsoft IT shop services company. But it's a joint venture between Accenture, which is what? The number one or the, one of the largest uh, services companies. And then Microsoft which is the largest is broad uh, tech company. And uh, this question came up as well. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, how do you, how do you make it practical? So it's, there's a difference between having frameworks and principles and then actually using it. So I actually mentioned uh, an institute called the Responsible AI Institute. It's, it's a nonprofit. It's supported by the Canadian government and now the U.S., different parts of the U.S. government supporting, I believe, the U.K. government and so on. They've created tools and they've created a, a certification system as well. So it may be, I don't know if, you, if you've looked at their work, but uh, it's very, very practical. It's meant to be practical, right? Yeah, I've heard about them. I've not looked too much at that work, but I'll definitely do. I think that's exactly what we have to do is going from principles to pragmatic ways you know it, right. I, I see data scientists like in my team and even in the past they want to do this like they want to make sure that their systems are correct it just says there is no unanimous decision on what should be done to address bias and to remove it take care of it and so on yeah in fact ashley casavan who founded this uh, group she ran the data program for canada and canada was the first country to come out with a a data, uh, you know, a policy program, and and their um, legislation they're working on in this area is, is world leading as well. And then uh, she she um, formed this uh, Responsible AI Institute, 
But she's a member of every major group that you can think of, whether it's UNESCO or the World Economic Forum, OECD, ISO, IEEE. I mean, she's got her, you know, her uh, capabilities in all of those different programs. And then what she and her team did is try to harmonize it, right? So, so uh, you know, taking the best of what's out there and saying, okay, how can we make it practical? So I... Uh, I think it's uh, really interesting uh, what she is doing. But, you know, what you're doing is really interesting as well. So uh, we're down to our last question. You've done so much. You won all these awards. You've been, uh, you created this system uh, with your team to help the U.S. when you're in this COVID uh, situation. Uh, you're you're um, leading innovation within this amazing company. And um, you're really interested in having sort of a social impact in a positive way, uh, truly sort of AI for good, uh, for good purposes. What final recommendations do you want to leave to the audience? Uh, I would say definitely to try and find their you know, why, so to say. And as you said, mine is definitely to try to have a positive impact on society is to improve a human condition through AI and all of these advanced technologies and not the other way around. And so definitely to try and find like better calling, better vocation, better why, and then to try only after to use all of these technologies like chat GPT and so on to try and achieve that mission. And usually that's the best way is like when we create a startup, you know, we have to solve a real problem. We have to help people. We have to understand their issues and only have to create a technology solution. So definitely that's what's been motivating me so far and what will be also in the future. So try to be good and try to use AI and all of these technologies to do so. And I definitely recommend this to everyone. Yeah, and in fact, I, I you know, those are great recommendations and I work with a lot of CEOs and investors. So we try to frame this in this language. We say purposeful leadership, purposeful innovation, purposeful business, purposeful capital and investments, but really purposeful. And then all of these uh, other words associated with it. So you're doing it in with with the mind of, uh, of, for the benefit of humanity and all of earth ecosystems. So really for tech for good or leadership for good or, and so on. And you definitely are the epitome of that. So yeah, Eugenio, thank you for, for coming in and uh, sharing so much of your insights with our audience. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to chat about all of these amazing topics. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.